the topic and the paper that I have chosen today, namely the organization of labor under socialism and what Marx and Engels had to say about it. Two, two reasons. The first is that Marx and Engels were not only critics of capitalism, but they were also proponents of socialism. And we must be alive to, we must be critical of, we must be evaluating not only the vast bulk of their work, which was criticism of capitalism, but we must as well be criticizing and looking at what they had to say about the socialist society that they foresaw. What about the account of socialism that they give us? So since Marxian socialism says that it will bring the emancipation of the working class, let's look at what Marx is offering to the working class, to the industrial proletariat. What exactly are they supposed to get out of it, especially in the workplace? And what criticisms can we offer about socialism in the workplace as they present it? Now, this topic brings together a number of areas that have interested me for a long time. Uh, I've written in the past about the division of labor and the thought of uh, Plato and Rousseau. I've, I've been interested in organizational matters with regard to various theoretical figures in the Marxist movement. I've also, in the past, delivered talks on Marxism. And about a decade ago, uh, I gave several summer seminars on the topic of Marx and Marxism. And in the course of it, I received comments from colleagues and discovered that there are differences, or it, it emphasized to me that there are differences in how people look at what socialism would be like in the workplace. Uh, some people see Marx as foreseeing, as portraying a, a liberated, undisciplined, unstructured workplace. Uh, indeed, an almost bucolic, rustic, uh, utopia of some sort. They, they tend to emphasize Marx's remarks in his work, his early work, The German Ideology, where he speaks about doing one thing today and another tomorrow, where he speaks of, in, in a single day, uh, hunting in the morning, fishing in the afternoon, raising cattle in the evening, and engaging in literary criticism after dinner, without at any time becoming, a, in, in a professional sense, uh, some sort of uh, hunter by profession or fisherman by profession or literary critic or so forth. And these scholars who think along these lines stress also remarks of Marx and Engels about freely associated producers, free associations of producers uh, being or, or what the situation would be in the workplace. Now, on the other hand, there are other scholars, and I... Uh, at the time I was giving these seminars, I uh, counted myself among them. And these point to passages in the, these scholars have a different emphasis and point to passages in the Communist Manifesto where Marx talks about labor armies and giving a sense of military discipline and structure in the workplace. Uh, these scholars would also point to and emphasize Engels' remarks in polemics that he had with a communistic anarchist at the time, uh, where Engels talks about the discipline of factory life, the discipline of work with large-scale machinery, and so forth. So this is a highly unliberated, a highly structured locale that Marx and Engels portray in these passages. And Lenin, I think, is following Marx when, in Lenin's famous work, The State and Revolution, Lenin says, we want a socialist revolution with human nature as it is now. Human nature that cannot, disp cannot dispense with subordination, with control, with managers. This Lenin here is talking about the marks of discipline, the marks of authority. Now, we have to ask ourselves in the light of these two contrasting portraits of what Marx might foresee in the workplace of socialism, 
Do we have one set of scholars who is just completely right and the other wrong? Were Marx and Engels confused, baffled, inconsistent themselves? Uh, what, what exactly is going on here? And this is the topic I have set to explore in the paper. I think we need to set in our own minds clearly at the outset what socialism is when Marx and Engels are talking about it. And I'm going to sketch that for you briefly. It is clearly the end of production or exchange, that is, production for sale or barter in the marketplace. There's to be no exchange whatsoever of this commercial sort between individuals or firms at all. There is to be no money whatsoever, no medium of exchange either. There is to be no private property in assets, no private property in resources. And as a consequence, Marx believes there will be no uh, business cycles, no depressions and recessions, no booms and busts. And as a consequence, he also thinks there will be no alienation. Uh, what alienation is is a very complex subject that I, I don't really have the time to get into. We might. It might come up in the panel or in questions and things like that. But it, and to give you some sense of it, uh, Marx sees the market itself as a kind of alien force that exists outside of human beings, external to them. Uh, they are not knowledgeable about its origins, its extent, the way it works. They can't control it. And somehow, through the next feature that I'm going to mention, they're going to bring it under control in socialism, and that is through central planning. Now, what this means is this, there's not going to be planning through a highly hampered market, such as you see in Russia or China, but planning in natural terms, planning without money or market information of any sort. Engel says, for example, that under socialism, Conscious organization on a planned basis will replace anarchy in social production. Likewise, Marx speaks of a society organized as a conscious and planned association. And Marx writes that the life process of society, which he says is based on the process of material production, does not tear off its mystic veil, that is to say, we can't really understand it, we cannot get at its real essence until, and we cannot end alienation as a consequence, until freely associated men do the producing and until these men regulate productive activities, quote, in accordance with a settled plan. Now, this, some of these phrases we should take apart and look at. Freely associated men, uh, by freely we mean in Marx, not freedom in some classical liberal or libertarian sense, but rather, uh, as Paul Craig Roberts and Matthew Stevenson have correctly pointed out, freedom in control over external nature, freedom in control over ourselves in, in, a, in a sense of rational planning by the state going on, and freedom that's based on a kind of knowledge and understanding of social necessity and, and essentially social science sorts of knowledge. Freedom, thus, for Marx and Engels, is a, is a kind of mastery of one's fate over natural and social forces. Now, associated means... To, to an extent, it's pointing to the fact that people are not independent, autonomous agents out there, but are dependent and inter integrated in their interaction with one another. And this is true enough. But I'm going to mention, as I go through this paper, how he sees this. And I'm going to point to some metaphors and models that Marx and Engels draw on, metaphors of the military, meta metaphors of producers' cooperatives, metaphors of factory life or firm organization of firms. Uh, so that will give you some sense of what socialism is when Marx and Engels are talking about it. 
Now, why won't socialism work? I, I don't want to go into this in great detail. Some of the other speakers are going to be bringing up some of this. Uh, it's not the main thrust of my paper. And Lou Rockwell, in his opening remarks, gave you some summary of what Mises' critique was. And my critique, following as well along the lines of Mises and Hayek, concentrates on four areas that I'll just very briefly mention to you why socialism won't work. First of all, because of pro the, the problem of property rights and the incentives that are not present or the disincentives that are there when property rights are gotten rid of or are so severely hampered and regulated as they are in practice in the existing socialist societies. So socialist managers are going to have the wrong incentives and they can't have the right incentives unless there are property rights there the incentives to act so that resources are efficiently used. The second problem is the problem of complexity of information. They can't gather the information that they need to have in order to plan the economy. They can't grasp that information even if they could get a lot of it together. And they can't use it effectively in the way that a capitalist entrepreneur might be able to do so. Then there are some problems of knowledge itself. The kind of knowledge that's needed to make an economy run often lies in the hands of people who are operating in the market. They develop a kind of lay of the land knowledge that can't be present to a central planner. And lastly, there's a problem that you might term the totalitarian problem. Namely, if you put a lot of power in the hands of people and tell them they can tell everybody in the society what to do with their lives, uh, they uh, tend to run away with that power and uh, not, and you, if you, you can't really check it if they're going to really have the job, the function, the charge of running the economy. And so you're setting yourself up for a, a tyranny, a despotism. And that, that is the essential core criticism that has to be made of the socialist utopia that Marx and Engels suggest. So the result is, the, the sum of all this, is that Marx's proposal, namely a moneyless, planned economy, is impossible, as Mises shows. And the, the countries that call themselves socialists today, the, the really existing socialist societies, as they're called, are ultra-interventionist economies. That is to say, they're, they're kind of super-fascism. They, they have a, a, a hopelessly hampered market. They, they still have m money of some sort, even though Marx promised that that would go. They still have labor markets of a sort. Uh, they, they're very much reliant on private plots in agriculture to support them with food. They require black markets both in manufacturing and farming. And they need uh, the international prices of the capitalist market in order to even figure out what's going on and what relative values are of any sort. So that's socialism and, and what's wrong with it in a nutshell. Uh, I'm going to outline for you now what I'm going to talk about in terms of the organization of labor itself. I think to see what Marx and Engels foresaw for working men and women under socialism, we have to look at several matters. We have to look at authority and discipline in the, mark, in, the, in the workplace. We have to look, secondly, at the division of labor. What is Marx proposed to do about the division of labor, a subject that he offers many criticisms that vary across the course of his intellectual career. We have to look at the payment for work, thirdly, the, the compensation that people have, the income that they will have. Fourthly, I think we need to look at labor mobility. Can people choose their occupation? Can they move from one work setting to another and so forth? I think in the case of Marx and Engels, we have to look at an, a different, an additional matter that's related in different ways to all of these things I've listed so far, namely the setting in the countryside, the setting in the city, changes that Marx proposes in this, what criticisms do we have of them, and so forth. And then I will briefly look at these models that I mentioned 
namely uh, producers cooperatives, factories, firms, and the military for what his view is of the associated life that people would experience in the workplace. Okay. Now, I'm going to argue that Marx does not really see a liberated 1960s uh, unstructured life for the worker in the workplace under socialism. He says it's going to be necessary under socialism to regulate labor time, how it's used, where it's allocated, and that means the people who, whose labor time we're talking about here. He's going to have to distribute, he says, labor time among various production groups. That means distribute people, send people, assign people where they're going to be going. He says, within the workshop, the iron law of proportionality is going to subject different numbers of work people to different functions. So we're talking about here the impact of planning and a planned economy itself on the lives of working men and women. And Engels, I think, went most explicitly into this. If, we, if people want a discussion of some sort, we can talk about whether there is perhaps a difference between Marx and Engels on this issue. I don't think there is. Engels, in his polemics with various communist anarchists, uh, asked them, how are they going to propose to run a ship, to run a factory, to run a railroad without having some sort of deciding will, without having some sort of single management? He says, these communist anarchists do not tell us their answer. And in a longer polemic, he proposes a hypothetical. He asks us to imagine, he asks us to bring up in our own minds uh, the following. Suppose that the, that the socialist revolution has been successful. Suppose that the capitalists have been dispossessed. Can you have organization without authority? Can you have, in, given that the work of modern industry is complex, given that it involves organized life, can you have organization and complexity of this sort without authority? Now, I just, as an aside, mentioned that as Misesians, we can say in a sense, yes, to the extent that the market is a kind of organization that doesn't have this sort of authority in its process. But uh, and in the sense that prices bring about a kind of organization without authority in the sense that Marx and Engels are talking about. But to continue with their hypothetical, Engels takes the case of a cotton mill. He says the machinery of the cotton mill has requirements. People have to be there to oil it, to turn it on, and so forth. Decisions have to be made if, they're, if things are breaking down or as to what, whether certain cloth is coming out at, at the quality that people want and so forth. Workers have to show up at various times in order to operate the machinery. Enough of them have to show up in order that there be a complement of work that will make it operate properly. Engels says that one may write on the gates of the factory, abandon all autonomy, ye who enter here. Or say a rewriting of a famous Latin tag. But uh, I think we can see that Engels is not offering the emancipated worker of socialism a free and easy, um, uh, a liberated lifestyle in the factory. And he goes on in discussing other examples, such as railroads and ships on the high seas to state why he thinks that authority is necessary in the workplace. 
Ultimately, he says, those who want to abolish authority and industry want, in effect, to abolish industry itself. He who says industry must say authority. And he accuses those who criticize authority and principle of being modern-day Luddites. Now, I think a lot of these points of Engels are well taken. And I think uh, in many respects. If I may switch to another ideological movement, anyone who has experienced within the classical liberal or libertarian movement uh, persons who are anti-organization per se, who are decentralist in principle, who are uh, uh, devoted to autonomy uh, above all else, uh, sort of Euro European greens, uh, green political movement transformed into America, know how exasperating this mentality that Engels is talking about can be. And some of you in the audience have had this experience or know about such people. Uh, and, and, and we could perhaps sympathize with Engels when he writes in exasperation that uh, these autonomists must be fools or traitors. But I think we must stop short of embracing Engels for important reasons. Uh, he has sociological insights, but I don't think that they should be embraced without some important caveats. He's framing his analysis in terms of authority, in terms of the sovereign will of the managers, and in terms of subordination. And this strain in Marxian thinking was highly influential, and, and in the time during the uh, early Soviet experience when there was a debate over one-man management, uh, Lenin is, move, is so moved and, and draws on this strain in Marx's thought so extensively uh, that he begins praising uh, political dictatorships uh, and for their positive uh, of the past, political dictatorships of the past, for their positive contribution to human welfare and human well-being. And uh, I think we can see that that strain in Marxian thought has led to a certain uh, comfort on the part of Marxian socialists with political dictatorships in socialist societies that operate in the name of Marx. Now, classical liberals, in, in, in contrast, uh, do not... Uh, embrace, indeed, deplore despotism. Uh, classical liberals can discuss these same questions, these same cases that Engels brings up, such as cotton mills, uh, ships on the high seas, uh, railroads, uh, in terms of concepts of property rights, in terms of contractual arrangements with clients, customers, employees, and so forth. Uh, without terming everything in terms of political power relations, as it seems Marx and Engels must do. Instead, classical liberals can talk in terms of human rights and contractual rights, property rights that are derived from these, are part of these human rights. So what happens in the workplace in a liberal society, in contrast to a socialist society, is constrained by property rights, by contractual arrangements. It's also constrained, of course, by serving the market, the fact that contractual arrangements are tested in and are serving the market, serving clients, customers, and employees. The manager cannot simply reorganize some workplace whimsically uh, because of his authority to return to the concept that Marx and Engels are emphasizing here. If a manager in a liberal society, a, a capitalistic commercial society does so, that manager will end up having the firm go bankrupt. Now Marx says that we have fundamentally two forms of social coordination. The market and planning. He says in the Grundrisse if you rob money of its social power, you must give that power to persons to exercise over other persons. 
And I think in this passage, we really get a deep insight and a recognition that Marx himself realized that the choice is, as economist Gregory Grossman put it, between gold and the sword as what will run, as what will drive the economy and the society. Now, Marx is going to argue that both gold, that is money, that is capitalism, that is the market, both gold and the sword, that is planning, that is uh, the armed proletariat and so forth, that both of these are coercive, according to Marx. But, the, that, the, but that the economy of gold is anarch, anarchic, and that the sword, <coughs> that the command economy is orderly, rational, and productive. The Misesians, such as ourselves, are going to say, and I believe correctly, that the economy of gold is voluntary, that the sword is coercive, that the, that the life of the sword is chaotic and disorderly, and that gold can bring about order, rationality, peace, and production. Now let me turn to the first of my topics, the division of labor. Now I think that Marx here is misunderstood because people dwell too much on the very, very eloquent, powerful, so-called humanistic Marxist passages of his early days. And do not dwell enough on the subtle, reflective, mature Marx of capital. Now, I am not one who likes to make a radical split, a radical uh, difference between the younger and older Marx, but I think as well with any writer who uh, writes for a long time, who meditates on subjects such as this for a long time, you can see a definite evolution in Marx's thought. By the time he comes to his mature conclusions in Das Kapital, he distinguishes between three things. The social division of labor, in other words, the occupations and jobs that need to be done and carried out in the economy and society, and the division of labor within the workplace. How exactly is the assembly line set up? Where, you know, what is the secretary's job? What is the foreman's job? What is the person who turns the wrench that tightens the bolt that whatever? This sort of thing. So the division of labor in the workplace, he radically separates off. And he says these are different in kind. Now this is, this is in contrast to market economists, who I would say, since Adam Smith, would view the entire division of labor as of one piece, perhaps different in degree, but not different in kind. That the division of labor one sees in the factory or on the farm is a smaller scale version of the way labor gets divided throughout society. And the last thing that Marx is distinguishing is the mode of production that is capitalistic or socialistic on which a society operates, he would differentiate from the social division of labor itself. So the difference we see in the mature Marx is that the younger Marx conflated, brought together all these things. Socialism and the abolition of the division of labor, he grouped that together, together with abolition of private property, together with ending of alienation, together, together with a plan, no money, and so forth. All of that almost became one thing or different facets of one thing. By the time he is a, m a mature thinker, he has broken these out, made them more separate analytic concepts for him. In Das Kapital, in capital, Marx contends that a social division of labor is a feature of all sorts of societies and indicates that he expects that it would as well be a feature of a socialist society. But the division of labor in the workplace that is found in capitalist factories, he says is solely a feature of capitalist societies. I think Marx would have to be disappointed to learn that 
such a division of labor, of course, persists in the really existing socialist societies of our own present day. But getting back to what he dreamed, uh, he believes that it is capitalistic production that makes for detailed work the sort of thing that Charlie Chaplin uh, humorously, uh, Charlie Chaplin, of course, being a communist, uh, humorously attacks in modern times, the movie. So it is this detailed work of capitalist society that degrades and injures the worker physically and intellectually, according to Marx. Now, there's going to be a difference as well in what the societal division of labor is under socialism as opposed to what it's been under capitalism. One is the consequence of the anarchy of the market, the anarchy of production under the market. Under socialism, the planners will be deciding what the occupations are, what the tasks are, what the jobs are that have to be accomplished. And as some have argued, particularly Roberts and Stevenson, two men I mentioned earlier. Perhaps Marx and the Marxians plan to escape the effects of detailed work on the workforce by deliberately planning things so that workers rotate through various jobs or have jobs that have a variety of experience to them. I think there's something to this claim this account that Roberts and Stevenson give, because indeed Marx speaks himself of how important change in activity is in pleasing the animal spirits of man, how that this has been destroyed, this change in activity has been destroyed by the detailed work that capitalism mandates, he believes, and how socialism will bring back this change, this variety. Okay, let's talk about payment for work. In Volume 1 of Capital, Marx says that how distribution, how distribution of wealth, how distribution of income takes place under socialism is going to vary according to the level of economic development that a society has attained. He offers a suggestion, namely labor vouchers in the period when full, complete socialism, full, complete communism has not yet been attained, they're going to be labor time vouchers that are going to allow people to collect according to the labor time that they have put in. And this, of course, this labor planning itself will be centrally planned by the central planners who are going to apportion labor time in order to make sure that various proportionalities are there. This is mostly mumbo jumbo since we think it cannot be done. And as I think we've seen in the various attempts, especially the war, so-called war communist period in the early history of the Soviet Union, to try it. Uh, when they do reach the final, higher, more abundant phase of communism, they're going to give people access to consumer goods according to what I think is a rather problematical standard, people's needs. But that is not the situation that he proclaims in the early period of socialism. It's not money. These labor vouchers will not circulate. And I think we know from Mises' own criticism that without money, this proposal of Marx's will simply be a catastrophe. And we know from the history of the Soviet Union, when they attempted a moneyless economy, they had famine, they had a complete lack of industrial goods, and they had to revert in the new economic period in 1921 to a partial reintroduction of, some, of, of hampered prices, of a hampered use of money, of a hampered market, but no longer what Marx proclaimed what socialism would bring. Let me talk about labor mobility. Now, I think... We have to understand here we're talking about occupational choice, moving from one job to another, and so forth. The view of 
Marx and his followers in the golden age of Marxism, so-called, that followed immediately after his, his death, was that genuine, full-fledged freedom of labor, freedom of, of occupational choice, had vanished with the disappearance of craftsmen and independent farmers. Independent farmers haven't yet disappeared. To some extent, craftsmen are coming back, but that's just sort of an empirical aside. Full freedom of labor, according to these Marxists, is incompatible with organized, cooperative, productive endeavors like industrial factories, large-scale farms, and so forth. Karl Kautsky, who was the literary executor of Marx and Engels, writes, It is true that in one respect the working man does not enjoy freedom under the capital, uh, 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 does enjoy freedom under the capitalist system. If the work does not suit him, this is under capitalism. The work does not suit him in one factory. He is free to seek work in another. He can change his employer. In a socialist community, where all the means of production are in a single hand, there is but one employer. To change is impossible. In this respect, the wage earner today has a certain freedom in comparison with the worker in a socialist society. Now, Kautsky dismisses this loss of freedom as merely the loss of the freedom to choose one's master. Uh, Bukharin, a, an important early Bolshevik leader who was executed by Stalin and has been rehabilitated recently, uh, also follows Kautsky in this in dismissing this loss of freedom. He says, in fact, that compulsory labor service and state assignments of workers to jobs is indicative of the organizational success and stability of proletarian rule. Trotsky, I think, is the most eloquent in this regard uh, in bringing out the effects of this control over employment on the lives of workers. Trotsky says, when we say to the Turner, that's a, a kind of a job, Ivanov, which is Smith in Russian, just a common name, you are bound at once to work at the Sormovo factory. If you refuse, you will not receive your ration. You cannot go to another factory, for all factories are in the hands of the state. In other words, for the working man, under the socialism of the future and under the socialism of really existing socialist societies, it's obey or starve. That is what emancipation of the worker amounts to. Now, what about town and country? Marx was one of the most anti-peasant thinkers in human history. He did not see peasants or small holdings as any way fitting with the course of progress. They were standing athwart the course of progress. He saw the development of society as overwhelming them. He believed that the march of capitalism itself was overcoming what he called the idiocy of rural life, a phrase that the Bolsheviks themselves were to uh, make much use of uh, as they themselves went after the peasants with sword and fire. Large-scale production, Marx and Engels believe, is now everywhere on history's agenda. And they believe wrongly that in their own time, farm ownership was becoming increasingly concentrated. Marx, in his inaugural address to the First International, says that, Would the capitalist farmers please hurry up and gather all the lands into a few hands, so that the agrarian question would be simplified for the socialist movement. Uh, August Babel was to argue that small, family, for, small farmers were the most backward, and therefore they should be the first to be expropriated. Indeed, in, his, the, in the woman, woman and Socialism, Babel argues that the social stratum of the small farmers uh, are required by human progress to cease to exist. I think we can see uh, that the liquidation of the kulaks as a class and Stalin's famine policy in the Ukraine in the 1930s 
are not exactly being called for directly here by these uh, early Marxist uh, theoreticians and politicians, but the ideological family resemblance between this Bolshevik mentality of famine and sword against the kulaks is implicit in the attitude that we see here in Babel. The family resemblance is obvious. So in the, in the Communist Manifesto, labor armies in the, in the countryside, expropriation of the land of the farmers, centrally planned agriculture, fusing of manufacturing and agricultural activities, and, uh, and a planned mandatory abolition of differences through time, gradually over time, between the countryside and the town. And I am running out of time. Uh, a few words about some of these models, and then I will sum, sum up. The cooperative model, producers' cooperatives, I don't think that the sense that some have that Marx favored uh, some sort of enterprise-level cooperatives being the most important uh, unit in the economy is at all correct. Marx makes very clear that cooperative, he's talking about a cooperative commonwealth, a completely nation-level cooperative, which th makes no sense. When you're talking about expanding the notion of a co-op to a national level, you're not talking about a voluntary uh, economic unit anymore. You're talking about a planned state-like operation. He indeed says that the, this cooperative life has to be fostered and sustained by the state and it's, it's really a, a, a metaphor and something he plans to have brought under a common plan and so forth. Uh, it's, it's, it's one big giant cooperative, and as a result, all the problems that Mises brings out about planning, about economic calculation, and so forth are going to come into place because there's not going to be a market for assets, for resources, there's going to be one big planning unit. So any sense of enterprise-level cooperatives, you should be disabused of that as what Marx foresees for the workers. The factory or firm model. Now, Marx says that all of society, all of the economy, should become like one giant factory. He foresees under socialism one commanding will, like that of the conductor of an orchestra, he says guiding the economy, an economy that will consist not of fragmentary operations, but rather of the combined labor of a single workshop extended to the national scale. Marx believed that erroneously that somehow we could abstract from the situation of a firm within the market and carry factory-style planning and management that are indeed dictated by the circumstances on the market out into the entire economy and society. And this is what the famous phrase, the administration of things that Marx talks about, refers to. I think here I need to mention that this model of the firm or the factory is where Marx takes his notion that he can solve the problem that he sees of degradation of the laborer's life in detail work, he can solve it because he looks at a factory or a firm where a manager can move people from one job to another or say, well, you spent part of the day doing this, now go do that. And since he sees the whole society and the whole economy in this way, he thinks that he can, in this manner, introduce job rotation and variation into the lives of the workers. To some extent, uh, I, I think we have to realize uh, I, I, I think we have to realize where this project of job rotation is going to take the Marxists. Uh, they're going to be moving people mandatorily from the shop floor into administration and back and forth. I think there are going to be serious problems with that in terms of 
talents that are there in the, in the workforce and so forth, whether this will work over a long-term basis, whether the iron law of oligarchy will come in and block such shifting back and forth from administration into subordination. He wants to require scientists and artists to engage in uh, mandatory physical labor. He wants, if necessary, to compel each worker in society to perform uh, undesirable dirty work and turn. Some of these suggestions, this last one is actually uh, Babel, not Marx, but it's in keeping with the spirit of Marx's desire to bring together manual and mental labor. Uh, I think here we can see the roots of the Maoist program of re-education of sending white-collar workers, uppity urbanites, out to the countryside for rectification. Uh, and, la and lastly, in connection with this factory or firm model, I, I want to mention a sort of a humorous note, and that is that uh, the, the, the example that, Mar that Lenin finds most appropriate in uh, suggesting what kind of factory or firm he has in mind moving to the national scale when the, when the armed proletariat takes control of the economy is he says, the whole national economy needs to be run along the lines of the post office. <laughs> so there is humor if you know where to look for it in this material. I can't really go much into the military model, but I mentioned earlier that labor armies is something that Marx feels comfortable in talking about. Lenin is uh, calling throughout the very early days of Bolshevism for universal labor conscription or general labor conscription. Trotsky, indeed, makes very plain that he sees it necessary to bring military discipline and structure and organization into such universal military conscription. Uh, Lenin, Trotsky, Bukharin, all see the grain appropriation via expropriation that they used uh, during this period, the early period of Soviet history, uh, to get farm goods into the, the countryside, from the countryside into the city or from the countryside into the army. They see this con continuing. They see uh, th this is uh, an extension of military methods. They don't. They see this as staying on during peacetime and so forth. So there is very much an authoritarian military model built into the notion of association and organization of labor and the workplace. Let me just sum up by saying what the conclusion is that I have about life in the workplace for the worker under socialism. In authority, we keep the dictates of large machinery we keep the manager as boss, although there's some hints at some sort of, demo, very vague hints by Marx, some sort of democratic oversight, bound, which I think would be bound to be unsatisfactory. There's going to be central planning and no money, Marx says. And Mar Marx says this is rational. Mises makes powerful, powerful arguments that it's impossible. The result, then, we see is military state capitalism, a kind of super fascism. The division of labor, it's going to remain, except for mandatory physical labor, uh, planned amalgamation of countryside and city, imposed uh, scrambling of intellectual and uh, manual work and so forth. Labor mobility. It's going to be less of it, and there's going to be a complete loss of freedom to vote with one's feet from one job to another. I think the conclusion that we have to draw here is pretty bleak, even in Marx's own terms. Marx says he's bringing emancipation of the working class. I say, the Misesians say, he's bringing empowerment of the political bureaucratic class and ensurfment of the working class. Thank you very much.